Well, it's here at last. <laughs> Dune. Denis Villeneuve's production of Dune. And since I waited eagerly for the David Lynch version 40 years ago and walked out of the movie theater stunned with disappointment, and since that disappointment made me dread the Sci-Fi Channel's adaptation of Dune, and since I have read Frank Herbert's novel a million times since it first came out, handed it to a million people, loved it, recommended it, uh, I thought it was right that I make a movie review. <laughs> this is a very, very bookish channel. I don't usually make standalone movie reviews, but uh, in this case, since it's a much-heralded, long-awaited, $300 million adaptation of the greatest science fiction novel ever written, I felt that I was justified. <laughs> uh, the movie is now out for distribution in America. Uh, Warner Brothers is distributing it here, but it's been out in large parts of the world. Uh, for a while, and reviews have started to flood in. Now that the movie has premiered in the American market, uh, the American dude bros, the film bros, have been flooding the airways with reviews. Uh, so I thought we'd go into that just a little. I thought we'd go into the movie just a little, and also, unavoidably, into some of those reviews, since you're not going to be able to miss them. If you're, for instance, not a dude bro, you're not a film bro, and you're also maybe, let's say, not a science fiction aficionado. Let's say you're just a normal, a normal person, and you're wondering if this big new movie, Dune, uh, is worth you going to see at IMAX on a Saturday night for a whopping total of probably $70 when all is said and done, when everyone has their tickets and everyone has their tub of popcorn. That's no small investment. Maybe you want to know about this thing. If you do, you're going to go looking for reviews. That's what most people do. Uh, and you're going to encounter a lot of these, these film bros. A lot of these film bros, I always say about them, I joke about them, that they all look like they could play either Harry Osborn or Peter Parker in a Spider-Man movie. But it's equally true that they could also play Paul Atreides in any movie of Dune. I can't help but think that conflicts them just a bit. First, I want to talk a little about uh, the, the movie, just in general, and then we'll talk about the critical atmosphere, and then we'll go into details. Uh, the movie, just in general, as you know, if you've ever watched this channel or if you know anything at all about Dune, uh, it tells the story of a science fiction space opera set thousands of years in the future in which a galactic emperor has ordered one of the imperial houses, the noble house of Atreides, and by that I mean not only their noble bloodline, but also their character. They are upstanding. They are noble. They are self-sacrificing. He has ordered that family to take control of the planet Arrakis, a desert world named Dune. Uh, where, that is the only place in the entire galaxy where the, the spice can be found. Spice is incredibly valuable. It's needed for a whole bunch of things, from facilitating space travel by the Spacing Guild to giving the secret of all-female society of the Bene Gesserit their basically biologically-oriented superpowers. Uh, and Arrakis is the only place where spice can be found. So uh, the person who runs Arrakis, the person who, ha who controls it on behalf of the Empire stands to be pretty wealthy, uh, and stands to reason might not want to leave that job. But the Emperor orders the previous owners, the previous occupiers of the planet Arrakis, the planet Dune, the House Harkonnen, who are not noble in any sense of the word. Their house title comes from their money holdings, and they are grubby and homicidal. <laughs> they are the opposite of the Atreides family. They have been holding Dune for generations, and are currently holding it uh, right before the action of the book and the movie starts, they're currently holding it uh, under the control of Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, the bad guy of both the first part of the, of the book and of this movie. Um, the Emperor orders a change. He orders House Atreides to go into Dune and take it over. He orders House Harkonnen to leave. And he appoints one of his own imperial ministers, uh, Liet Kynes, as a judge of the change. Liet Kynes is also a planetologist who has been studying the ecology of Dune a desert world, the only place where spice can be found, and where the spice patches are guarded by absolutely enormous carnivorous sandworms. So, an ecological puzzle. Uh, so this character has divided loyalties in many more ways than one, because in addition to all that, uh, Liet Kynes is also a religious figure of almost quasi-religious veneration by the native inhabitants of Dune, the Fremen, who exist in in the the villages and towns, but the, by far the greater number of them exist wild out in the deserts where the sandworms roam, where the storms can strip the flesh off bones, where the Harkonnen, the civilized 
uh, inhabitants of the Imperium believe there can't be an extensive civilization. The Fremen actually live there with still suits designed to recapture all but a tiny handful of their body's moisture, with generational lore about how to survive in the desert, how to deal with Shai Hulud, the great sandworms, and a bone-deep hatred of the Harkonnens, who not only exploited the planet Arrakis for their own gain, but also hunted the Fremen mercilessly in pogrom after pogrom. Now, the Emperor knows perfectly well and despises the ignoble Harkonnen, but he fears the House Atreides. He fears the leader of House Atreides, Duke Leto, who's far more popular with the other noble houses than he is. The Emperor clings to his popularity through a combination of hereditary right and also the military power of his fanatically uh, effective soldiers, the Sardaukar, his private army corps that can easily defeat the private army corps of any other noble house. So that makes the emperor something you have to, you have to obey him. You have to walk warily around him. Uh, the emperor wants to destroy Duke Leto and House Atreides. That's why he arranges for this swap. Because once Duke Leto is in on unfamiliar territory, once he's left his watery, beautiful, green, lush homeworld of Caladan and gone to Arrakis, he will be off his pins and needles and vulnerable to betrayal. Vulnerable to being wiped out. And the Emperor does this because he knows he can count on House Arconan to be, to be uh, biddable, to be a partner in that scheme, whereas other Imperial houses might refuse. Uh, that is the, the vast geopolitical machination behind the beginning of the story. Uh, what follows from there is that it turns out that the Bene Gesserit uh, have, been pri have primed the Fremen on Dune to be expecting a messiah figure, a young man who comes from off-world and who will lead them to glory, who will make uh, the desert planet where they live and suffer into a green wonder world. Uh, the Fremen have been primed to expect this person, but they have no idea when it will happen or who it will be. Uh, and that's important because Duke Leto has an extensive household. He has uh, a mentat, sort of a living computer, named Thufir Hawat, who served his father and his father before him. Uh, he has war masters, essentially leaders of various arms of his military unit, the troubadour warrior Gurney Halleck, for instance, a uh, younger and, and more uh, sexually appealing warrior leader called Duncan Idaho. Uh, he has a family doctor, Wellington Ewa, who's been conditioned by the Imperial School to guarantee that he's trustworthy, that he can't be suborned because, of course, he's going to be dealing with the Duke's own physical person and with also the person of the Duke's heir, his son Paul. Paul Atreides is also going with him to Dune. And going with all of these people is uh, the Lady Jessica, who is Duke Leto's concubine, but not his wife. She's the mother of Paul Atreides. There will never be any other concubine. There will never be any other heirs, uh, because she and the Duke love each other. The Duke has only officially not married her in order to give the other houses in the Imperium the idea that maybe he might make one of their own, his official wife and duchess. And that leaves open lines of alliance, of allegiance, possible allegiance, uh, that he thinks might be useful. That's the only reason that he hasn't married her. He loves Jessica. And Jessica is an adept of the Bene Gesserit. She, is, she, is, wasn't not just, she was not just taught by them when, when she was a child. She's a fully due-paying member of this secretive society, for whom she has been ordered by Duke Leto to produce a daughter. The Bene Gesserit, like I mentioned, because of the spice, they have vast control over their bodies, functions, and whatnot. So it's, it's a given, it's understood that she can control the gender of her child. But she gives the Duke a son because she knows that he wants one, and she loves him. And that screws up the Bene Gesserit's breeding program. They have a generations-long breeding program where they're trying to arrive at a super-powered male Bene Gesserit, a figure they call the Kwisatz Haderach. It's very interesting because it means that on parallel tracks, both the Fremen and the Bene Gesserit are working their way towards a messiah. Uh, and one of the broader, I don't want to say lessons, that sounds very parochial, but one of the, one of the broader takeaways, certainly, of Frank Herbert's original novel is pity the planet that needs heroes. Be wary of getting your messiah. You won't get what you bargained for. Uh, in the book, House Atreides is betrayed. Wellington Ewa, it turns out, has been subver subverted by House Arconan because of his love of his wife, 
who has been captured and tortured by the Harkonnen, uh, he is subverted into betraying the household. And he subdues physically Duke Leto with a drug, changes out one of his teeth for a capsule with a poison mist in it, on the assumption that Baron Harkonnen is lying to him, on the assumption that Baron Harkonnen has in fact killed his wife, and is not merely holding her over the doctor and for the doctor to do what he's told, and also on the assumption that Baron Harkonnen will want to gloat over Duke Leto face to face. So he makes when he's extracting the tooth from the drugged Duke Leto, he makes sure to tell him, remember, when the Baron gets close to you, you have a chance to kill him. Just bite down on the tooth and a poison cloud of gas will erupt around you. And that will kill him. And if you do this for me, if you kill him for me, this man who killed my beloved wife, I will save your lady and your heir. I will make it so that a helicopter is available to get them free of the Harkonnens once the Harkonnens strike your household. You do that for me, I'll do that for you. Uh, and that's what happens. And it isn't just the Harkonnen that attack House Atreides. The Emperor wants to make absolutely sure that this work, so he disguises several legions of his own Sardaukar as Harkonnen men and sets them up in the invasion in order to make sure the House of Atreides is defeated. Uh, it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work entirely well. The Duke, of course, dies. Uh, but Baron Harkonnen gets away before the gas can kill him. Gurney Halleck gets away and joins up with smugglers on Dune, but refuses to leave the planet as long as there are Harkonnens to kill, as long as there are uh, his masters to avenge. Thufar Hawa survives and eventually falls under the, into the employ of Baron Harkonnen, although never really switching allegiances inside his heart. Duncan Idaho survives at least the initial attack and goes into the desert. Uh, and Paul and Jessica survive. They are being flown into the desert uh, to be lost in a, in a giant sandstorm so that Baron Harkonnen has deniability. Uh, but they survive. <laughs> they survive not only the attempt to kill them, but also the storm themselves and the desert, and eventually end up making an alliance with the Fremen. So that Paul, who is their messiah figure, is given the greatest fighting force in the galaxy. The Fremen are accustomed to a far harsher world than the Sardaukar and can defeat them easily in battle. All they need is a leader. And the machinations of the Baron and the Emperor accidentally give them just the leader they've been looking over. A figure uh, who matches not only, who eventually becomes, thanks to the uh, spice saturating his body, Paul eventually does become the Kwisatz Haderach. He eventually does become a superpowered male Bene Gesserit. But in addition to that, he's also the Messiah figure that the, that the Fremen have been waiting for. It's, again, a massive convergence. Both those societies get the figure they've been waiting for. It's just they don't get what they were expecting. Uh, and the galaxy isn't ready for what's going to happen. And the rousing conclusion of Frank Herbert's novel Dune is Paul Atreides and the Fremen, mounted on sandworms, taking revenge against the Emperor, who has come to Arrakis to make sure that it sorts itself out, that has come to, the, to, to Arrakis as a not-so-subtle reprimand to Baron Harkonnen for screwing this whole thing up. Uh, that's the rousing conclusion of the book. The book's uh, concluding scene is, scenes are amazing. Uh, and for a long time, people have wanted to film this book. I mean, Dune was published in a weird, almost sounds that way, but it quickly gained traction. As more and more readers discovered it, it quickly gained traction. Word of mouth, reprints, and then infinite more reprints made science fiction fans realize that their genre really doesn't get done much better than this. Uh, and there were sequels. Herbert wrote sequels, and a lot of the sequels, in my opinion, are every bit as good as the first book. But the first book is pure magic. Discovering it for the first time as a science fiction reader is a purely magical experience. Uh, and many film directors over the decades have had that experience and have naturally wanted to film the thing. Uh, there have been two uh, attempts that actually made it to the eyeballs of viewers. One, the aforementioned David Lynch, which is not only... Uh, one of, if not the worst, cinematic adaptations of a work of literature ever done, but also one of the worst movies ever made by anyone of any kind. <laughs> it is a howling embarrassment from beginning to end. And so the, the film bros love it. And then decades later, the Sci-Fi Channel made a, a miniseries 
uh, of Dune that I think is is rather good. I think a lot of it holds up rather well. Certainly the visuals are much more consistent with Frank Herbert's book. And also the the script is much more consistent with Frank Herbert's book. The, uh, Lynch invented a lot, always to the detriment of the source material, as we want to call the book. Uh, but the rumor has been for years and years that Denis Villeneuve wanted to film this thing, and now it's finally here. And now that we've covered what the what the, the source material is, uh, we should get to the movie. But before we get to the movie, we have to deal with the film bro criticism of it. And that film bro criticism puts two sort of floral arrangements on the table and just expects you to take them as a given. Two things that it puts there. Every single one, I've watched a hundred reviews by these young guys, and every review they do puts these two floral pieces on the table and just expects you not to look at them. We're not going to move them because they're just part of the scenery. They're a given, a complete given. And both of them are wrong. Both of them are, are not givens at all. Given number one, and uh, to be fair, the film bros aren't the only ones who say this particular given, is that Dune the novel can't be filmed as a two-hour movie. Not with any kind of, of uh, fidelity. You either have to warp it the way David Lynch did, or you have to make it into some longer thing. But you can't possibly do, let's say you had two and a half hours. Straining the patience of a modern audience, but let's say you had two and a half hours. And let's say... You had $300 million. Even given that, a movie a, a movie studio, a Warner Brothers, coming to you and saying, you can have $300 million, a cast of your picking, and two and a half hours. Even given that, it one of the, the, the assumptions, the arrangements, the flower arrangements on the center table that the film bros and everybody else are just expecting you to take as a given, is that even given all those resources, you can't possibly film this movie in one, in this book in one movie. That is completely false. As we're going to see, that is completely false. Just because no one's ever managed to do it doesn't mean it's not possible. And the second floral arrangement, the second absolute given, deals with this movie specifically. And that is every film dude, every film bro everywhere in the world saying that Denis Villeneuve is a genius. That he's a great filmmaker. His body of work does not show that at all. Not at all. <laughs> because... There's a lot more to being a, mov a movie director. First of all, we want to get a little bug boo out of the way here, which is the directors don't matter all that much. Film bros and film snobs of all kinds, long before there were film bros, will howl in protest when you say that. But generally speaking, it's true. But even if we assume, let, even if we grant for the moment that directors matter, there's a lot more to directing a movie than creating big, flashy, visual set pieces. There's a lot more to being a director of a movie than doing that. The two biggest things that a director of a movie does is control the tone and control the pacing. You want to get great performances out of your actors. You definitely want to arrange those cinematic set pieces. You want to make sure your, DO, your director of photography knows what he's doing. But you have other things to do. You're, if you're a great director, it will show in every moment of the movie. It won't just show in the big operatic set piece scenes that have become de rigueur in all movies in the 21st century because our movie directors learned their craft from watching video games for 10 hours a day. Uh, it's just a byproduct of what you get. When, <laughs> and, and because all of the film bros have spent, spent 10 hours a day playing video games and maybe one hour a week watching any movie made before they made a Twitter account, they equate big, beautiful video game set pieces with great movie making. That's the only possible explanation I can come up with for why they universally say that Denis Villeneuve is a great filmmaker. He most certainly is not. The proof is in the pudding. A great director will make great movies, not great set pieces. <laughs> you know, uh, Denis Villeneuve's director of photography for Dune is Greg Frazier. And Greg Frazier is undeniably talented at those massive set pieces. But that's not the same thing as being the movie's director. So I wanted to address both of those floral set pieces first and deny them both. You don't get to make those givens. You have to make a case for that. You can't just say Dune can't be filmed in one two-hour movie and Denis Villeneuve is a great director. You have to have some sort of proof to back that up, both of them. And you don't in either case. But even so, I was hopeful. Very hopeful. How could I not be? 
this is one of the greatest science fiction novels ever written. This is the biggest movie dir uh, directing budget that will ever be thrown at this project. We will never see another Dune in our lifetimes. I think it's very unlikely that we will, unless 10 years down the line somebody gets the green light for a miniseries of some kind or other. And if they do, if some director does get the green light for that 10 years down the line for a streaming service, which is what I think all entertainment will be by then, I guarantee you the opening line of their elevator pitch to get that money, to get that green light, will be them just saying, well, you know, the reason I want this project is because we all know Dune can't be filmed as a two-hour movie. And every head around that boardroom will nod. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. And, I might add, internally contradictory. No big revelation when it comes to film bros, but nevertheless, if you're calling this guy a great movie director, if that's one of your floral set pieces, the other one shouldn't be that this is beyond his capability and anybody else's. If he's a great movie director, it's not beyond his capabilities. <laughs> or shouldn't be. We get the movie. We get Villeneuve's Dune. And I did not see it in an IMAX theater. I did not see it on the big screen with a tub of popcorn. I think that's insanity. In, in a world that is absolutely racked by the Delta variant of COVID-19, I think it, it's absolute insanity to go to a movie theater packed with rude people and see this thing on the big screen for some sort of fetishization of what it should look like. Most of the people who are fetishizing that have TV plasma TV screens as big as one wall of their living room. They're not losing out on much of anything, by, by except nostalgia, which film bros are big on. Never... You'll never find a group of people more intensely slap in the face nostalgic than young men in their 20s who've never felt anything, never experienced anything, never gained anything, never lost anything. <laughs> You'll never find anybody more nostalgic than the people who can least back it up. Uh, aside from that, nostalgia, I can't imagine a reason to see this in theaters. But I did see it. And I watched it carefully. Uh, and <sighs> this is part one. A fact that was very carefully kept from the general audience. In fact, I would argue the general audience still doesn't know that when they get to the movie theater, pay the $20 to get this ticket, the screen is going to tell them right away, this is part one. This is part one. This is Denis, Denis Villeneuve saying, you can't possibly film this movie in one go. So I need two and a half hours and $300 million to film one third of the story I opened this video describing. How he manages that, I don't know. I don't know the ways of cocaine. <laughs> but one way or another, I don't know how you convince anybody of that, uh, but it, he did. Uh, and it's not really the critic's job here to determine whether or not this is a good movie. This is not a good movie. This is a bad movie. Really, it's the critic's job to figure out why it's bad. And I think I know the reason why, ultimately, it's bad. Uh but first, I want to tell you a little about it. It opens with, uh, it's, a, it's a two and a half hour movie. It feels like one, like the first hour is set on the aforementioned watery green world of Caladan. Does that opening sequence waste a lot of time? Yes, it does. It does indeed. I would say that in this movie's two and a half hour runtime, probably a good solid hour and a half, 90 minutes, half of the movie was wasted, was bloated was pointless, dragged, certainly did not uh, did not point at getting the movie done. In other words, for this $300 million and this cast, uh, this dream cast, and this uh, definitely visionary cinematic masterpiece director, could you have done the whole book, Dune, in one movie? You certainly could have. You certainly could have. You could fit 10 really good, intense, quick scenes to move this thing along just in the first part on Caladan. The first scene of any movie about Dune that wants to get the whole novel filmed in one sitting should be the Atreides waving goodbye to Dune from the portal of a spaceship. <laughs> waving goodbye to Caladan from the portal of a spaceship. None of the movie should be set on Caladan. That just, that just goes without saying. All of it can be done in dialogue en route to the desert planet Dune. The whole book is called Dune. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Uh, you probably know already all about the casting. I, I, uh, I've jotted down some notes about the casting, but you already know. Uh, Rebecca Ferguson plays Lady Jessica. She has a huge role in this movie. Because, because this is part one, it only takes us to Paul and Jessica uh, uh, allying with the Fremen. It takes us just that far. 
uh, those of you who know the book, in the book, uh, when Paul and Jessica first are found by the Fremen, uh, Paul falls afoul, totally accidentally, no ill will on his own part, of one particular Fremen named Jamis, who demands to fight Paul to restore his honor. And because of Fremen tradition, Paul has to kill him. Uh, and it's a tense, well-done scene. It's done well in the sci-fi adaptation, for instance. Uh, and it's it's done well here, I guess. <laughs> I guess it's done well. We, we could talk forever about the combat choreography in this movie. And also the combat consistency. This is a world where people have personalized force fields. So if you're, if you're slashing or hacking at someone, it, your force field is going to stop them. You have to move slowly to kill them. The physics of that is remembered, Villeneuve remembers it only when it's convenient for him not to forget it. It's kind of ridiculous. But, but that is when this movie ends. So this, is, this movie is basically the betrayal and fall of House Atreides. Pretty large amount of chutzpah on the part of a director and a movie studio to foist that on a movie-going audience without telling them. Uh, but this is mainly the fall of House Atreides. This is the betrayal of, of Dr. Yua. This is the substitution of the tooth. This is the machinations of House Arconan. We never see the uh, the Imperial Emperor in here, the villain of the piece. Is House Ar is Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, which is played by Stellan Skarsgård, uh, and his evil nephew, Beast Raban, <laughs> who's played by Dave Bautista, that a lot of you will know as Drax in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. Uh, they are the villains of the piece. And uh, the Atreides et al. <laughs> are, are a mixed bag. Uh, Duke Atreides, Duke Leto, is played by Oscar Isaac. Uh, playing slightly above, uh, I would say, his optimal age range on the screen. Uh, Gurney Halleck is Josh Brolin. Duncan Idaho is Jason Momoa. Fantastic, as always, both of them. Uh, Stephen McKinley Henderson plays Thufir Hawat. Weirdly. Uh, Howard is a huge missed opportunity here. The most impressive person in Duke Leto's entourage, by far, should be Thufir Hawat. He should look like the end of the world. He's seen everything. He's done everything. He is the, uh, not only a mentat, but a master warrior and assassin. And here he's played as a, something of a ponce. And that's weird because Stephen McKinley Henderson is, in my opinion, the best actor in the movie. You'd never know it from this movie, but nevertheless, you'd never know it here, but he is. Uh, Rebecca Ferguson plays Lady Jessica. Uh, I think I think I mentioned that. And uh, Denis Villeneuve originally earned a little scorn for me by uh, virtue signaling and announcing to the, to the popular press, and especially to Twitter, uh, that he was race and gender swapping a character in the movie, the character I mentioned earlier in this video, the imperial servant who judges the change between houses to make sure everything is done legally. Liet Kynes, who is also a figure of enormous cultural importance to the Fremen, uh, because he has taught the Fremen privately that it is possible for them to utilize the physical characteristics of Arrakis to change it into a green and watery world. It'll take a long time to do, but the planet itself has the resources. Liet Kynes is actually the, the, uh, the opposite of a messiah figure. He tells the Fremen that the, the better future is possible through their own hard work through science, and that it's the, his calculations are beyond question, that this will happen. He gives the Fremen a secret mission long before they have a secret leader. Uh, Denis Villeneuve announced early on that he was going to race and gender swap Liet Kynes, that Liet Kynes would no longer be a white man, instead he would be a black woman. And I howled about that, not because in this particular instance it matters all that much, although <laughs> although it, when we're talking about fathers and sons, daughters and whatnot, it is kind of important, but maybe not all that important. I, I will grant you that. Really, the thing that bothered me is the, the, the presumption of it all, to, the pandering of it all, to think that, okay, I, I, I fought really hard. I went, I went to everyone I could to get the ability to, to adapt this book because I love it so much. What's the first thing I want to do? Change it. That doesn't... The presumption of that drives me nuts. But uh, Villeneuve cast uh, Sharon Duncan Brewster as this new Liet Kynes. And she's terrific in her scenes. Uh, she doesn't have enough screen time, in my opinion. But that brings us to uh, the performances in this movie. And that's going to be a big stumbling point for a lot of people. Maybe not. A lot of these people are fan favorites. I think that was probably a determining factor in a lot of this casting. 
But this movie is is drastically miscast. And even the parts that are well cast are poorly done. There are no good performances in this movie, almost to speak of. Jason Momoa really doesn't do a bad performance, but that's because he very cannily sticks to his range. <laughs> his Duncan Idaho is perfectly within his range. So he does Duncan Idaho perfectly in this movie. I would say that Sharon Duncan Brewster does a fantastic job as Liette Kynes. Standout fantastic. But what difference does that make if the marquee performances are either bad or badly mishandled? <laughs> what difference does it make? Oscar Isaac is comatose as Duke Leto. This is, this is supposed to be a noble figure at bay. A noble figure who knows he is leading his family into a trap. What we see, or what we're supposed to see in Duke Leto, is serenity, serene, just, noble rule, upended, thrown into chaos. This is not the Duke Leto who has ruled for years on Caladan. This is that kind of serenity ripped away from this character. Instead, Oscar Isaac, in almost every scene, even right to the end, acts like somebody who's trying to figure out the electronic hall pass on a Club Monaco elevator. <laughs> He's no more engaged than that. Uh, I, Josh Brolin, of course, does a really good job, but it's impossible to watch the movie without casting him as Duke Leto. He's the obvious choice for Duke Leto, and yet he's playing Granny Halleck. I don't understand that. I don't understand that at all. <laughs> but we can, we can get into alternate casting all you like. There are all sorts of Reaching outside the ecosystem of the movie, there are a whole bunch of casting decisions that I would have redone. For instance, the center of the show. This movie is very much the Timothy Chalamet show. He plays Paul Atreides. His face plays Paul Atreides. Very much this is the Timothy Chalamet show with guest stars. <clears throat> Which would be great if Timothy Chalamet had any acting ability, but he doesn't. <laughs> Hollywood seems to want to turn a blind eye to that fact, but nevertheless, it's true. He is stunningly beautiful. He has never been more beautiful on camera than in this movie. And Villeneuve and his DOP certainly know that. The camera loves Chalamet, lavishes attention on him, lingers over him. In every J. Crew angle imaginable, we get him sad, we get him angry, we get him most of the time, 95% of the movie, completely stoned off his ass stoic. Just no matter what is happening. <laughs> he, is, he has the same facial expression virtually throughout the entire movie. I'm not going to uh, guess here on whether or not that stoned off the ass affect was actually literally through on stage, but I want to posit just one thing. I'm not making any accusations there. I just want to say, if you're Denis Villeneuve and you've cast Timothy Chalamet as Paul Atreides in the $300 million movie of Dune, and he shows up to set every single day stoned off his ass, what are you going to be able to do about that? So yeah, I'm extrapolating, I'm wildly guessing, but if it were true, there'd certainly be no aspect of this movie that would stop it from being true. And that's not what you want in Paul Atreides. You want, Paul Atreides is, is not only coming of age, a teenager struggling with all of those figures, but he's also experiencing prescient visions of the future. In some of which he's dead, in others of which he is the, the messiah leader of ravenous legions of, of, Fre of Fremen warriors assaulting and ravaging the entire galaxy. None, almost none, of his future visions are comforting to him. What you want in this Paul Atreides, in other words, is a young actor who can convey surface serenity with boiling conflicts underneath. Timothy Chalamet cannot do this. <laughs> this is just a simple fact. Now, I have all sorts of alternate casting in mind, all sorts of minor actors, actors who haven't really hit it big yet, who are really, really good, one young Irish actor in, in particular. But even if you wanted to go with a big marquee name, I know that his name is in bad repute with fans and fandom and the larger world in general now, but Ezra Miller can certainly do placid exterior with boiling conflicts underneath it. He can certainly do that. And he's just borderline young enough to maybe pull off being Paul Atreides. But Timothy Chalamet can't at all <laughs> do this. Now, the movie also features Zendaya as Chani, a Fremen woman who will become Paul Atreides' version of Lady Jessica. Not a wife, but beloved. The only love of his life. Uh, she doesn't have much screen time in part one of Danny Villeneuve's Dune. She's terrific, but she's terrific as always. She's always great. And again, 
when we're talking about mixing and matching casting here, I don't know what to do about Stephen McKinley Henderson. I just don't think he should be in this movie. I think it should be someone else who plays Thufur Hala. I don't think Timothy Chalamet should be in this movie at all. <laughs> no way. Stop throwing big rolls and huge amounts of cocaine money at this kid. He is out of his depth. He cannot act. Everything that he does in the two and a half hours is either stone staring or hyper melodramatic yelling. He's never convincing. Even the way he reads his lines is off by a crucial beat or two every time so that you know you can definitely feel that it's take 17. That should never be true. Most of the rest of the cast, uh, Rebecca Ferguson notwithstanding, she does a terrible job in this movie. I don't know much about her as an actress. I don't think I've seen another performance of hers, but the film bros who are saying she's terrific in this movie had too many edibles before their popcorn because she's terrible. Just acting school terrible all throughout. But at least she hits her beats. And everybody else in here is, is a seasoned professional. But Chalamet, every single scene, it's like you can tell that he's tired of repeating these lines because he got the first 16 takes wrong. It pulls you out of the movie every single time. <laughs> Zendaya doesn't do that. In my opinion, she's a force of nature. And if we're talking about weird alternate casting for Dune, the casting that I would love that would never in a million years happen, and I would argue shouldn't happen, but nevertheless, when I was watching the movie, I was thinking, imagine how effective she would be as Paul Atreides. Imagine how amazing that would be. Uh, you might think along these lines that I think that Stellan Sarsgaard was miscast as Baron Harkonnen. And I admit, there were parts, there were moments watching this movie when I thought, how amazing would Dave Bautista himself be playing not the nephew, but the uncle, playing Baron Harkonnen? And then I remembered, no, Stellan Sarsgaard is great. He's fantastic. Any of you saw him in Chernobyl will know that. Don't judge him by his recurring idiotic bit pieces in, Mar in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He's amazing. He would be a great Baron Harkonnen, except that this is the third time in a film of Dune where the director has not trusted to simply make Baron Harkonnen evil. This is the third time that has happened. The first Baron Harkonnen in the Lynch movie is literally a gibbering lunatic, someone who would have, who could not possibly sign finance reports, who could not possibly run an imperial household and hold onto a planet. He would be knifed by someone, an underling, or replaced by the emperor in two seconds. He was literally insane, covered in pustules, a gibbering lunatic. So, totally unbelievable and nothing like the character in the book. You don't have to stay loyal to the book, but you have to give me a convincing villain. And the, the Lynch movie does not. The Lynch movie's villain is a gibbering lunatic. And then you get the sci-fi channel where, where Baron Harkonnen is played by a slightly more talented actor, but he's a foolish figure who ends every one of his <laughs> scenes with rhymed couplets. <laughs> There's not a moment anywhere in that miniseries where he is the slightest bit threatening. Not the slightest bit frightening in any way. You wonder why anyone around him thinks he's intimidating or frightening in any way. And you know when you're watching that version of Baron Harkonnen that the Emperor would never trust him. Not in a million years for a complex scheme that could turn the whole of the Imperium against him if it's found out. So naturally, with those two examples in front of me, I was thinking, well, okay, Villeneuve, the master, the master director, won't get that wrong in this movie, but Baron Harkonnen is horribly wrong. Horribly wrong. He, he's this massively, he's a massively fat character in the book, and one of the book's weaknesses is to equate that with evil. But even leaving that aside, let's just say it's just a personal characteristic. That's not good enough for Villeneuve. Instead, he wears these weird moo moo outfits and he wears a suspenser belt because he's so fat he finds it hard to walk. But the suspenser belt is used in weird Jedi ways. And on top of that, he's he's not just he's not just fat, he's also otherworldly fat. As far as I could tell, there are a number of scenes where he's bathing in excrement. <laughs> He's often seen shrouded in mist as this quasi-human figure. The whole and and also when he is shown in clear relief, the facial makeup 
the fat suit and the age makeup and the bald makeup and the whatnot is so bad, you can practically see the seams where you will peel it off at the end of Stellan's day on set. And you might say, well, that's really hard to be convincing about. But I, Claudius, was really convincing about it 70 years ago with $150 special effects budget. The special effects budget for this movie, the makeup effect for this, mo for this movie, was $30 million. <laughs> $30 million just for makeup. And it's so bad in this movie that you can barely stand to watch it. Oh, it's my own little sandworm. <laughs> oh, hey, baby. I'm ranting to the film bros. <laughs> she watches out for my blood pressure, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I lost before I got licked in the schnoz. Oh, right, Baron Harkonnen is another of this movie's totally missed opportunities. I remember in, like, his second scene, I remember thinking... Junk this completely. Take all the makeup off Stellan Sarsgaard, including the baldness. Take it all off. Put him in a suit. And just let him be evil. <laughs> just let him be evil. He would chill the blood of every single person in the audience. Instead, we get this kabuki cartoon that no one would take seriously. Least of all, Beast Raban. Dave Bautista does a great job as Beast Raban. He is the real villain of the movie. And he does a fantastic job, but he would not be afraid of this cartoon character at all it doesn't make any sense whatsoever none at all uh i saw these missed opportunities over and over and over again the one that hits you over the head the most in the movie is rebecca ferguson as lady jessica and you know i i, I make a little joke just just to get the the film bros all upset about zendaya being cast as paul atreides that i don't see how that could ever happen but in a perfect world talent would go with part and we just wouldn't care. Uh, which you you might th I I that that is my opinion. Even though I was mad at Villeneuve for race and gender swapping a character in this book, I wasn't mad at him because of the race or gender that he swapped it to. I was mad at him because you don't fiddle with a book that's already great. If you look at Dune as a director with a prospectus to to direct the movie, and you and you look at it and you say there really isn't enough representation or diversity here, then you don't pick that project. It's not that you pick that project and then change the book. That having been said, the whole course of the movie, especially when I was done with it the first time, was thinking on it. I kept thinking how effective Sharon Duncan Brewster would have been as Lady Jessica. If you are race and gender swapping and you're comfortable with that and you're expecting that your audience will be, what difference does it make? The skin color of the actress put her in as Lady Jessica. Oh, my Oh my, what a movie that would have been. Instead, it's scene after somnambulant scene with with Rebecca Ferguson getting everything wrong. She's over-earnest, or she's over-stoical, or she's really dialed out of the scene almost completely. There was the one mother-daughter relationship that I actually detected in the, in the on-screen Paul and Jessica, is that a lot of times neither one of them just seems to give an F about what's going on around them, when you wouldn't get that impression in a million years. Not in a million years. So, to put it mildly, the cast bothered me in this movie. Oscar Isaac just is not committed. He's not involved. He's capable of almost anything. But we don't get it. In this movie, we don't get it. Uh, I, to the point where I kept wanting Josh Brolin in the role of Duke Leto, because Josh Brolin could hit the role of harried nobility, nobility at bay, out of the park. As a crusty warrior, Gurney Halleck, well, you know, you know as well as I do, that Hollywood is full of actors who could do that job. Duke Leto is a more complex part, and it doesn't get complexity. And so on and so forth, right down the line. Just the, the casting drove me nuts all throughout. Now, Greg Frazier's cinematography is at times amazing. Uh, I was a little worried when I saw the trailer and the teaser for this movie at the decision to film it in black and white. And I had film bros come to me. I know some film bros. I had them come at me and say, it's not filmed in black and white. It's filmed in stark, monochromatic palette, but that's not black and white. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. When it's taken to this extreme, it's pretty much black and white. Show me a moment anywhere in this movie where the, the, the color sticks in your memory. It isn't there. The, sin, the signpost uh, action set piece in the book, in every adaptation of this thing that will ever be done, is a sandworm attacking a spice factory and eating it 
and Duke Leto and his son and their entourage getting away just in time. And that scene is practically monochromatic. It's just done in a, a washed out, dead faced beige all throughout. Most of the movie is like that. And you come to be grateful for that sandblasted beige for the moments when it's not like that. <laughs> the interior moments are filmed literally in the dark. <laughs> Characters mumble, they mutter. There are shadows where shadows shouldn't be. This is not the work of a great director. This is the work of a director who just doesn't have any idea what he's doing and who's casting a sh an eye over his shoulder all the time in a nervous way towards all sorts of factors that should not be on a director's mind. Should not be on the director's mind. The director shouldn't care what the film bros say. The director shouldn't care what the Dune novel purists say. The director shouldn't care what science fiction film movie aficionados say. The director should be directing his own movie, not looking over his shoulder at a whole bunch of factors and hoping that he gets everything right. You need look no further than the great Hollywood production of Moby Dick to know what that looks like when a director doesn't care about any of that stuff and is just making their own vision of the movie. Instead, we'll, we'll even talk about Hans Zimmer's film score here. When is this guy going to retire is what I want to know. Every one of his film stores sounds exactly the same. The only people on earth who are bat-tuned to hear any variation in any Hans Zimmer film score are the film dude bros who are going to listen to it. <laughs> They're the only ones who can tell one Zimmer soundtrack from another. And boy oh boy, uh, Denis Villeneuve certainly wants you to know that it's a Hans Zimmer film score because it plays at maximum volume throughout the movie. <laughs> throughout the movie. Which doesn't go well with the aforementioned muttering and stuttering. <laughs> there are plenty of scenes where you have no idea what the characters are saying. You know perfectly well that Hans is getting his paycheck, but you don't know any of what's happening in the scene. The you, without subtitles, you would be lost. That happens throughout, and that's on the director. None of this business of the 21st century and its absolute anathema for accountability, that's what drives me crazy most about this century. You incite a violent mob to attack the capital of your country, you do it on camera and live stream so the whole world is watching, and then no more than a month later you're denying accountability for it. You, you get handed $300 million and a swimming pool full of cocaine to film a gigantic version, a movie version of Justice League. You do so. You put your name on it, slap bang in big, huge letters. And then when a certain aspects of the film bro community or the purist community don't like it, what do you do? We say, oh, it's not really my movie. I, the, I, the movie studio had a gun to my head. I didn't want to make that movie. I have my own version of the movie that's 16 hours long. That's the movie I wanted to make. The one that I put my name on, the one that was supposed to be an exponent of my craft. Oh, no, that wasn't me. I don't take any accountability for that. What are these directors doing if they aren't making movies? If we don't hold them accountable for, for the ability to make movies, then what are we holding them accountable for? How can all of these spit-curled film bros say that Danny, Danny Villeneuve is a great movie director if in the same breath they're going to say that all of these mistakes happened and also that he couldn't film the whole movie in one, the whole book in one movie? That, those are not the, the signs of a great director. Those are, those are the signs of a bad director. <laughs> when you finish watching this movie, if you are the slightest bit familiar with the book, you will realize, well, okay, instead of sitting me through that wasted 30-minute stretch, you could have got a lot of movement done on this whole thing. A lot of movement. The betrayal of House Arconan, uh, the betrayal of House Atreides in Denis Villeneuve's movie Dune, no bloody part one, just Dune, the, the, the movement of House Atreides to Dune and its betrayal by House Arconan and the Emperor Sardaukar should be the first half hour of the movie. Half hour is an eternity for a talented director. Instead, I think Paul picks his nose once in the first half hour, and that's it. But it's such a pretty nose. <laughs> when you get to the end of this movie, if you're familiar with the book, you're going to say, the book would have fit in this movie. Instead, we are primed for more accountability avoidance. We're primed for that. Now, I don't think this movie is going to do well. I don't think it's going to make back. It, it costs $300 million to make. It costs another $200 million to of a PR budget. That's an enormous ticket to make back. It basically has to make a billion dollars. I don't think that's going to happen. I think Villeneuve can probably count on uh, some re-watching, some repeat viewing by the young tween audience because Timothy Chalamet, he might be talentless. He's totally miscast in this movie. He's four feet tall. It, 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 
Paul is in the book. We're told he's small for his age, but Chalamet is not believable at all in any way in the main character part in this movie. He, he's all of those things to his detriment, but he is astonishingly beautiful, and the movie lingers on that fact. So maybe this Dune will get some repeat viewing from tweens, tween girls, tween boys, but not enough to salvage it. Not enough, I don't think, to to to, to raise its boat above its budget level. And if that's true. There'll never be a part two. So once again, we have a director in a perfect position to say, well, you know, they never let me do what I wanted. I can't, I, I know people have been, some people, not film bros, the film bros will call this great no matter what. They call Villeneuve a god. But some people will, once the, the initial spice high is gone, some people will look at this thing for the train wreck that it is. And they, when Villeneuve hears those things, I guarantee you, he will avoid accountability. He will say, well, you know, this is the movie that I wanted to make. It's actually a five-hour version that you don't know. You've never seen it. But if we cobbled it together, you give me another $5 million, I'll gladly show it to you. That's the movie I wanted to make. What's that you say? I had a totally free hand in Hollywood, in Jordan, in Abu Dhabi. I, I was a god on earth. I could do anything I wanted with any amount of money. Well, yeah, that's true, but I, I was still a victim here. <laughs> <laughs> this movie is I don't think it's going to make back its money I don't think it's going to do well I don't think Warner Brothers is going to green light a sequel which means we're, if I'm right about that we'll never get the rest of the Villeneuve Dune this will be it this will be a, one of those oddities in cinematic history which primes Villeneuve to dodge responsibility for this thing until his dying day and all of his film acolytes to do likewise <laughs> I'm not looking forward to that at all <laughs> not at all this is a a dull, it's occasionally beautiful, but it is a dull, affectless, badly miscast, and horribly directed movie. So, <laughs> my advice to you would be to return to the book. Just go to the book. Or, visit the book for the first time. Quite a few film bros, far too many film bros, were opening their have opened their reviews of this movie by saying that they'd never heard of Dune, that they'd never read a page of it, they don't know anything about it at all, Maybe time to fix that, <laughs> okay? And we'll just we'll just hang fire until this cinematic master comes out with another movie. <laughs> In the meantime, I don't think I'll be watching another Denis Villeneuve movie anytime soon. I, I was duty-bound to watch this one because it's Dune, a book that I have loved forever. But uh, this is a failure. It's not as big a failure as the Lynch movie, but that would be hard to happen. It would be hard to make that happen. There are hundreds of people involved in the making of this movie. It'd be hard to come out with a movie that bad. It isn't as bad as that. Uh, but <laughs> that's not saying much. Uh, so there you go. The, this is a Dune movie that was made out of fear. <laughs> that This was Denis Villeneuve constantly looking his, over his shoulder at the film bros, the film aficionados, the Dune aficionados, wondering the whole time of all the neck-bearded crowd saying, respect the lore. And the movie flop drips with sweat. It, it flop drips with that fear. So let that be a lesson to you, okay? You film bros out there and all you other viewers, let that be a lesson to you. Fear is the movie killer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>